The spring anime season is upon us yet again, and as you all probably expected, I'm here in usual timely fashion to recommend my favorite shows and tell you all why I think you should be watching them. After all, it's been one entire year since I started making these videos, so let's take a look at what's been going on in this wonderful world of anime. <laughs> You should know the drill by now, we're only talking about new series here. No continuing anime from last season like Dododo or Shield Hero, and no sequel seasons like Attack on Titan or One Punch Man. No matter what the quality for any of those series may be, it's more fun to acknowledge the new stuff. And besides, you guys are gonna complain no matter what I include on here, so who really cares? All of that being said, dear god this season is not great. Last season I proclaimed winter as being one of, if not the best season of anime I've ever been a part of. So many good shows ranging over a variety of genres to the point where I feel like everyone got at least one or two anime that they were really enjoying. And I assume the universe took that as a sign that I'm simply too happy with anime and life right now because spring 2019 might very well be the worst season of anime I've been a part of. We have a plethora of incredibly mediocre or straight up terrible anime to choose from this season, so if you wanted time to work on your backlog, this would definitely be the opportunity to do so. If anything though, that just makes my my job easier and more fun, finding the diamonds in the rough to recommend you guys. And stay tuned till the end of the video for a very special anime giveaway to thank you guys just for being such great viewers. Without further ado, I am Phenom Sage, and these are the top 5 anime you should be watching from Spring 2019. If you've been a part of the anime scene for a little bit, there's one name in the industry that might have passed your ears, Kunihiko Ikuhara. Despite only really being known for three series that he's helmed in the past, he's garnered an immense reputation for the, uh, strange methods of storytelling he explores in his shows. On top of his stories, he has a visual flair that is instantly recognizable. I preface all of this to say that he's a weird dude. He makes weird shows and often breaks the boundaries of what many other directors directors would be willing to do. And I don't think that's any less of an appropriate assessment on his latest work this season called Sarazan Mai. Don't get what I mean? Well, let me just try my hardest to explain the plot to this show. We follow three boys named Kazuki, Inta, and Kuji, all three of which in typical Ikuhara fashion seem to be linked together by fate and find themselves in a situation where they are turned into mythical Kappa and must fight Kappa zombies by flying into their butts and extracting their Shirikodama in the aim to gain something called Dishes of Hope that will allow them to wish for any one thing. All while these shady couple of cops are behind the scenes causing trouble while doing this obscenely well animated dance sequence. It, it's a freaking weird show, man, and that's part of the appeal. You simply can't get this kind of absurdity from anywhere other than an Ikuhara show. Now, it definitely is an acquired taste. Some things may not make sense, you might be turned off by the stranger and more grotesque elements of the show, and that's fine. But the only thing I can reply with is that Ikuhara doesn't care. He pushes boundaries. He's going to do stuff that you've never seen before, whether you want to see it or not. This extends from the story itself to the way it's presented. The direction, the visuals, it's all got a distinct flair that I mentioned before that really accentuates the vibes of the show. The stylized disregard of any background character, the integration of real life footage, the weird, weird imagery throughout. The best thing you can say about the presentation is that it really sells what a unique series this is. Another thing that I really like about Ikuhara's stories, at least in the one that I've seen, Mawaru Penguin Drum, is that Ikuhara has a tendency to set up a lot of seemingly random plot threads throughout the story, and by the end manages to tie everything together in incredibly satisfying ways. I can only hope that continues to be the case here, because there's a lot of thematic potential with these characters who all have their own personal motivations for wanting their wish, and a lot of their inner conflicts and secrets have already 
we've been tying together in unexpected and interesting ways. There is a lot of potential with where this story can go, so if you don't mind or are even looking for something new, something original, something different, then I think Sarazan Mai will do the trick. Takenanda. Making anything comes with a lot of baggage. You're not only messing with a property that already has an established fan base, but you're also trying to take that property and reinvigorate it for a new generation. Now, obviously, that can be challenging trying to appeal to an old fan base while also cultivating a new one, but oftentimes it works out for the best. Now, I'm not gonna lie and say that I have any experience with fruits baskets, fruit baskets, okay, that's weird. I don't have any experience with this series, so I can't tell you what's been changed, what's been faithfully adapted, or how it compares to the original. All I can say is that the 2019 remake of Fruits Basket is one of the best shows this season. Yet again, taking a beloved property and introducing a new audience to it, aka me, has worked out incredibly well and only makes me more existentially aware of all the great things I've missed in my life. Fruits Basket revolves around the Soma family, a group of assumedly 12 people who all represent one animal in the Chinese zodiac. Our main character, Toru Honda, who recently lost her mother, eventually finds herself living with Yuki Soma and Shigure Soma, and discovers that if she hugs them to any capacity, they turn into their respective animals. Now, despite its massive popularity, I didn't even know what to expect when entering this series, and what stood out to me the most so far is how genuinely great all of the characters are. This is a colorful cast of personalities that keeps things interesting all the time. Now, it is a shoujo, and you didn't even have to know that beforehand to spot it a million miles away because you have all of the trademark shoujo archetypes. The silent stoic charmer, the tsundere delinquent, the responsible and witty onichan, and the kind-hearted dits protagonist that all of these characters orbit. This is from a different time, so it's understandable why these archetypes exist, but what's surprising to me is how well their personalities still hold up, and how much I already like them. Toru is the biggest example of this. She is so unbelievably likable in everything that she does, and the reason for that is because of her circumstances. She's lost her mother, she's lost her father, she's put in a situation where she is all alone in life. She has the opportunity to ask her friends or distant relatives for help, but instead she chooses to take on these problems herself. And that's what I love about her character, that's what's refreshing. She doesn't wallow in her misery. She she doesn't think more of herself or even think about pitying the situation that she's in. She's just ridiculously proactive and thinks about solving her issues on her own through determination. The first episode mirrors this perspective perfectly. We get such an explicit look into how messed up Toto's life is. I mean, she's living in a tent for God's sake. And yet, despite all of the messed up things we see Toto going through, the episode maintains this very perky and uplifting atmosphere to mirror her outlook on life. It is such a weird contrast to have all of these messed up things going on through this rosy-eyed perspective, but it worked. It works immensely well in making me care about Toto's life and happy when she eventually finds her home. Fruits Basket is a shining example of storytelling being able to transcend time itself. Itself. If you haven't seen this series and want to see why people fell in love with it in the first place, or you have seen this series and simply want a reminder, you can't go wrong giving this a chance. <laughs> If there's one thing you should know about my taste in anime, it's that I love shonen. Much like other people, I was introduced to anime through shonen, so the genre and all of its little quirks, no pun intended, have a special place in my heart. There's something really comfy about the way most battle shonen approach their stories. It's derivative, sure, something many people complain about, but I think the reason it is derivative is because a lot of the aspects it's known for are both timeless and universally appealing. The themes of overcoming obstacles, the focus on 
friendship and family. The cool fights, power-ups, world building, Shonen is special to me, and the latest venture in the genre comes this season in the form of Kimetsu no Yaiba, a world filled with demons who roam the land, and the story of a boy named Tanjiro, who loses all of his family save but his sister, who has been turned into one of these creatures herself. With nothing left in his life except for her, they embark on a journey to hopefully change her back and seek out the demon who killed his family. Kimetsu no Yaiba is interesting because despite the intense love for Shonen I just proclaimed at the beginning, it didn't immediately grab me. Now don't get me wrong, the first episode was definitely good. Fantastic production, great soundtrack, wonderful voice acting, basically anything you could want in an adaptation, Yaiba delivers. But there was still something missing. A hook, a draw, something in the story that keeps me coming back and wanting to see more. And for myself, that hook came in during episode 3, and I know it's not quite fair, but I'm not going to tell you what that hook is. All I can say is that like most shonen, the perception you have on the series and the story in episode 1 is so small in comparison to where it will be a hundred chapters down the line. Battle shonen are typically great with world building, and I've really liked the seeds that Yaiba has planted in regards to future characters, factions, and story arcs. It's not stretching to say that I have loved Yaiba exponentially more and more with each passing episode, because of the way that the world expands from Tanjiro's point of view and the way his character develops. Of course, being a shounen, you have to expect the usual shenanigans, lengthy expositional dialogue, over-explaining practically everything, super dramatic speeches, etc, etc. I find it charming, I think it's funny and entertaining when characters go into their Soka, he ran across the ground to get into my blind spot to throw a rock as a distraction, but actually he was walking at a slightly slower pace to offset my brain's perception of his motion, Keikaku Dori Subarashi. It's fun, it doesn't usually go overboard, and the dialogue in general works, even when it's silly. It cannot be understated the potential I see in this series. The world, characters, mythology, not to mention the legendary adaptation UFO Table is delivering right now, it, it's the stuff I love most about Shonen, delivered on in all of the right ways. And according to manga readers, we aren't even in the parts that make this series special. If you have a similar love for Shonen that I do, definitely give this a shot. Now I know what you're thinking. What is this? What is this moe trash that I put above a high budget shonen adaptation like Kimetsu no Yaiba, above a long awaited reboot classic like Fruits Basket, or above an insane Ikohara mind trip like Sarazan Mai? What is this show about a girl who speaks through haikus doing so high in a must watch video for the season? And I'm glad you asked, I'm gonna tell you why. I like many other people, enjoy happiness. I like feeling warm and fuzzy and good about life. And while anime is a perfect escape from reality to the worlds of drama, action, and science fiction, another place you can escape to is a perfectly normal reality where a girl and a boy become close to each other inside a literature club. That girl's name is Nanako, quite possibly the most precious creature I've ever laid eyes upon in my entire life, who is too shy to talk, thus she communicates with other people through expertly written Sinryu. The boy on the other hand is named Eiji, a kid with a bad reputation throughout school despite being good natured at heart, and most of his notoriety coming from simple misunderstandings more often than not. We jump into the story with these two characters at the beginning of their friendship. Nanako is simple and pure so she pays no mind to the reputation Eiji has around school, and Eiji on the other hand is finally able to talk to someone without them being scared or running away so he he also likes spending time with Nanako as well. Sinryu girl at the end of the day reflects Nanako's personality. It's very simple, it's very genuine, and my god it makes me happier than anything I've watched in a long time. I would go so far as to say that this is quite literally an unadulterated personified version of happiness in anime form. It's a perfect look into characters lives, both our main duo and the side characters surrounding them, where everyone is just so lovable and so fun to to be around because they're all legitimately good-hearted people. And I know that must seem pretty standard, tons of series have nice characters, but with Sinryu Girl there's just something different about it that's hard to put into words. Watching these characters interact with each other fills me with a joy that 
honestly just makes me happy to be alive. There are so many great examples, but take episode 2 for instance. Nanako and Eiji are sitting down to have some lunch when Eiji, being the socially awkward teenage boy that he is, comments on how he thinks Nanako might be getting chubby lately. Now Nanako, being the pure sentiment role that she is, takes this as a challenge and becomes determined to slim down and show Eiji that she can take care of herself. Afterwards, we have a little training scene with her and Eiji's sister, well, well not really his sister, but just stick with me here, and she comes back better than ever, putting Eiji's hand on her tummy while clearly embarrassed but proud to show him the progress she's made. Now, I want you to legitimately look at this face, this proud, determined little face, and tell me you do not become a happier person just looking at this girl. It's impossible, man. I'm gushing just looking at her right now. All while this is happening, they're blending great comedy, fun gags, and just entertaining dialogue in general. Another aspect to this series that lends itself to the satisfaction I get from watching it is that it's actually a half-length series. That meaning each episode is only 12 minutes instead of 24. Now, to a lot of people, this might be a turnoff. Why would you want less of a series that you're enjoying? How can you become invested in such a short amount of time? With a series like this, though, 12 minutes is more than enough time to tell these many stories and various interactions these characters have. Any more than that and I could see the series having to fill up time with meandering or boring aspects that kill the pace of the dialogue and little arcs. 12 minutes is a good amount that simply means all killer, no filler. So yeah, this isn't the craziest, most over the top series airing this season, but it is special. It's heartwarming, it's charming, and if you want something simple that will most likely make you a happier person, I can't recommend it enough. Can you feel my, can you feel my, can you feel my tears, they won't try. Out of every genre that anime has tackled over the decades, I don't think there's one quite as underrepresented as the musical genre. It's something I've wished to see more of for many years, and while there are definitely some great ones out there, even some of the best musical anime are less about the music and more about the characters. Now obviously that's not a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination, but sometimes it just makes me wish we got a more genuine look at the world of music. Enter this season's Carol and Tuesday. From the legendary mind of Shinichiro Watanabe, creator of a bunch of different classics I'm sure you've all heard of, we have a series that aims to do just that. Show a misty-eyed and dreamy perspective on music, its presence in our lives, and how it affects the people creating it. Now, Shinichiro Watanabe would be the kind of person to helm this project. Not even for the obvious comparison that you can make to his other musical series, Kids on the Slope, but because music has always been an integral component of every single series he makes. From the jazzy western themes of Cowboy Bebop, to the hip-hop tunes of Samurai Champloo, Watanabe always uses music as an extension of his project's identities. So when you have a story like Carol and Tuesday, where the theme is all about capturing the human soul of what music can be, I don't think you could have found a better director. Carol and Tuesday's premise finds us on a colonized Mars, a place of futuristic technology and artificial intelligence, a world where entertainment and even the very lives of its people has reached an automated state. This is the perfect setting for our eponymous leads Carol and Tuesday to make their mark on the music industry by giving them songs that aren't created by AI. So yeah, it's a pretty blatant message, but appropriate, and realistically portrayed by the world surrounding them. Cars drive themselves, you have to specially order a human waiter if that's what you want. Everything is automated, including the entertainment that the public digests. It's this thematic storytelling of human soul versus artificial product that gives this series this whimsical and optimistic portrayal I mentioned before. It almost feels like a modern fairy tale, or a future fairy tale, I guess, where the bubbly and go-lucky attitudes of these girls will eventually spark a positive change and they'll get there happily ever after. The series as a whole has such an unabashedly silly and charming vibe to it that reminds me of classic musicals I used to watch as a kid. Even the opening itself embraces that charm when Carol and Tuesday start dancing on the sidewalk and random pedestrians join in. It it's just so quirky and fun. It's the kind of series I see being infectious with its joy and the fact that it's 
confirmed for 24 episodes leads me to assume they have big plans for wherever they decide to take it. Naturally, I also love that these girls interact with each other in a way that's reminiscent of a place further than the universe. It has that quick-witted and emotionally resonant friendship that feels so natural in such a short amount of time. And naturally, as you would expect, the music is exceptional and has a good chance of being one of the best soundtracks this entire year. Watanabe has such a large amount of clout that he's brought in dozens of foreign artists to create music for this series, and it shows in how distinct and varied the musical identity of this series is. There's just so much going on for this show right now in everything it's done so far. It's been a truly magical experience that I think will appeal to the majority of people who give it a chance. Of course, Netflix has it locked up right now, which means you'll have to either wait over half a year to watch it on their platform or sail the high seas. But if you do have the opportunity to give it a chance, you should. Because it is the number one series you should watch from spring 2019. All, despite being a pretty weak season, there are definitely some great anime hiding in there for you guys to enjoy. Just like I have some great anime here that I'm ready to give away to you guys for being such amazing people. High Dive reached out to me and sent me limited edition Blu-rays of both Haikyuu Season 1 and Gakko Garashi to give away, which if you haven't heard of either of those series, well, you are in for a treat. You can enter to win these simply by going to a Twitter post I will link in the description, following me, and commenting which Blu-ray you would like to have. I'll give it two weeks, randomly draw the winner on May 21st, and send them out the following day. Also on top of that in the description is an absurdly long promo code for 50% off a subscription to High Dive. That first month would be like, what, $2? And you would be able to watch a bunch of amazing shows like Land of the Lustrous, Made in Abyss, Girls Last Tour, Flip Flappers, or even this season's Sinryu Girl. Pretty good deal if you ask me. And on top of all the shilling, you can also join my Discord server. I'm always there chatting, there's an amazing community of people, we have group anime streams together, we have seasonal best girl, best boy polls, it's a lot of fun. So if you want to join, make friends with us, a link to the server is also in the description below. Finally, thank you so, so, so much for watching, and of course, as usual, have a great day. Today with you.